Hello and welcome to the Chalk Valley History Show. Now obviously today we should have been welcoming you here to this wonderful, beautiful part of the Chalk Valley for the actual festival. COVID-19 sadly has put pay to that, but we haven't rolled over, we're still here and we're doing what we hope is the next best thing, which is bringing you seven days, seven programmes full of new talks, living history, a delve into the archives and much, much more beside. We really hope you enjoy it. Come on! Welcome to the Chalk Valley History Show on Monday the 22nd of June. Now of course this is a day that the Chalk Valley History Festival 2020 should have started. We can't do that because of Covid-19 but what we can do is give you a flavour of some of the things we were planning to do this year. So each show we're planning a main talk with a brilliant historian who would have been coming to speak at this year's festival. We've got living history, we've got spot history and we're also raiding the archives of the past few years to show you clips that you might never have seen before. And throughout this week, you can contact us on social media here. Hello from lockdown. Um, so I was asked to share with you an object that means something to me and I brought this along. I thought you might be interested. So um, normally if I'm doing a talk, I pass this around the audience and I ask them to guess what it is. Now I can't pass this to you, so I'll just describe it and you'll have a few seconds to think about it. It's, uh, it's fairly bulbous at one end. It's quite a short handle, so um, those of you who are guessing baseball bat are automatically wrong. It's got a little end here. It's got a stamp on it. I'll show it to you. It's not going to help you at all, but this bat, like me, made in Essex. has nothing to do with what it was actually used for and why I find it interesting. So, got a guess? You got it right, let me tell you what it is. It is in fact a calisthenic baton. So this was given to women during the Victorian era, uh, Edwardian and into the Georgian era, as a means of getting rid of those bat wings that none of us really like. Stay young and beautiful. So this is the kind of thing you'd be encouraged to do, this kind of circular movement and to exercise. But the reason I think it's really fascinating is it was the weapon of choice of the suffragettes and there was a very good reason for that. The length of it is absolutely perfect for concealment. So imagine this, you have a suffragette wearing a very elegant coat, she's walking down the street, she doesn't look like she's attracting any attention uh, from the police whatsoever. And if she sees the police charging towards her leader, um, what would they do? Well, they would do this. They would simply let it slip, grab and swing. So this, was the suffragette weapon of choice and I'm very happy to share it with you. Oh, I'm four two one three three Company Sergeant Major Charlie Cooper. I'm Captain Thrush, 
I'm the commanding officer of B Company, 10th Battalion, the Essex Regiment. We're here in the front line in France, uh, somewhere in the Somme section, I can't be any more specific than that, and uh, we're holding the front line against all colours. I'm Lance Corporal Mitchley, 25034. I found it a great opportunity. I was working on the farm before, didn't like that. Hard work, hard work. It's not too bad here. Apart from the shelling, I'm not too keen on the shelling. Well, as CEO of B Company, I am technically responsible for around 200 chaps. The officers think they run the battalion. The NCOs do run the battalion. Think of me as a headmaster, if you like. I've got to maintain discipline at all levels from my officers right down to the lowest, lowliest of the privates. And that generally means maintaining an air of aloofness. But Mr Thrush is a good sort, got a lot of experience out here, and the lads look up to him. He's all right by me. The day starts just before dawn when we have stand two, the best time for Jerry to attack. So, while it's still dark, Everyone that can bear a rifle and the Lewis gunners will man the parapet, scanning no man's land in the event of an attack. We uh, stick our heads above the parapet, keep an eye out for Jerry, make sure he's not advancing into our lines. Don't want him advancing into no man's land. Jerry's got the sun at his back, the sun always rises behind Jerry, so we have to get down when it gets light or we'll start collecting rounds. As the light comes up, we slowly keep our profile down until we're eventually fully in the trench, just keeping an eye out and an ear out, listening for him coming over our parapet. When full light comes, we stand down, those that are not on sentry duty, clean rifles. Sentry by day, you use the trench periscopes. No one puts his napper over the bags in the, by the light of day. Once we've had the rum ration, we'll then take time to clean up a bit, have breakfast, cook some food if we haven't got some already come down the line. We'll uh, clean our weapons. The medical officer will often come round and check our feet, make sure we're not getting developing trench foot. Once he's been round, pretty much the day's hours. Not a lot you can do in a trench apart from sleep. Every spare minute I get, I sleep. Because the one thing you don't get much of in the line is shut eye. It's not what you'd call comfortable for any of the ranks. Obviously, we officers do somewhat better than the, than the chaps do. Um, there's no specific place for them to sleep, for example. They sleep on the fire step. We do at least have a bunk. Get your head down, get as much shut eye as you can, because you ain't going to get much in the evening. As far as going to the cars, he goes, well, if you're caught short in the front rank, that's what your entrenching tool handles for. You hit your entrenching tool head. Dump on it, chuck it out into no man's land. If there's not much activity from the Hun, we'll get hot food. Typically, in the morning, you might get bacon and porridge, hot, fresh. The Russians are not bad at all. <laughs> Some people back home think we eat rats. We don't eat rats. Rations, terrible. McConnick is meat and veg, disgusting. Pork and beans, disgusting. And bully beef, that's all we seem to eat. Food for officers is a slightly different case in point than that for the other ranks. Um, Broadly speaking, we try and fend for ourselves. We club together and we buy our own rations and our servants will provide us with hot meals as and when they can. Having a servant isn't something that should be regarded as a status symbol. Uh, the army recognises that we have quite enough to do keeping an eye on the chaps, looking after them, making sure they're supplied. Uh, and so giving us a servant to provide us with food simply means that our efforts are being concentrated in the right sort of place. It's not exactly what you'd call good living, but uh, we do all right, and we get parcels from home, of course, so uh, my wife sent through a, a cake and a rather lovely pork pie. Army post is one of the great miracles, to be quite honest. Um, if I receive a letter from home, it only has to say Captain Thrush, 10th Battalion, the Essex Regiment, and they will find us wherever we are located. Yeah, we, we get to write letters, as many letters, we're encouraged to write letters, in fact, to let the folks back home know that we're all right. Mail's good. You can have a letter written at home this afternoon. We could have it tomorrow, on a good day. And the more post there is, the better it is for morale.
after dinner, obviously it starts getting dark, so we need to stand to again. As it becomes dusk, we'll stand behind the parapet with our bayonets fixed, listening out for Jerry. As night falls, this is where the activity really begins for us. The amount of uh, work we have to do, commanding the company, keeping everything supplied, making sure we keep on top of all the statistics which Brigade want us to keep supplying them, means that it can be anything up to a 20, 22 hour day sometimes. We like to dominate no man's land with patrols, to deny Jerry freedom of movement in it at night. Silence is of course maintained and the lads have to start digging. Sweat saves blood. If you've got damage to the trench, it's repaired at night when you, when you won't be seen doing it. At the end of the night, we come back to the dawn stand to. And that's our, that's our day, that's our 24 hours. If it wasn't bad enough fighting the Germans, often you feel you're fighting the weather as well. During the winter, it can freeze solid. I've never known it so cold as out here in France. When the trenches freeze solid, it really is like iron. When the rains come, they really come, and the trenches flood, and sides, parapet will wash away, paradox will wash away, dugouts are flooded, and we're continually battling against water. <laughs> Rather ironically, though, you can get long periods of extended good weather, as we had in the Somme this summer, where we actually have to warn the chaps to be careful with naked flames, because the danger from fire can be so great. In the ideal world, you get four or five days in the front line, then a week on rest at least, then a week on reserve and then back, and back into rotation again. Just because we're at rest doesn't mean to say we're immune from working parties and such like. The Royal Engineers will often turn up and ask for a, a party to go in, back into the front lines even to repair trenches. It's actually quite a misnomer to say we're at rest. We're often never busier than when we're actually uh, at rest, but we do get some time for sports and recreation, so it's not all not all work. If we're on rest, we, case, we might be able to go down the local estaminet. Now we like the estaminet because you get to drink lots of wine. Don't drink the beer, it's watered down. And you get to eat egg and chips. Now we all like egg and chips, or earth and fritz as we call it. So I'm up for van plonk, pom frit and earths. That does me. The Somme battle's pretty much come to its conclusion now, and we have finally taken the, the, uh, the, the positions that we were hoping to much earlier than this. I'd like to say it'll all be over by Christmas. Jerry seems short of this and that. Like I said, we get good rations and plenty of it. Jerry looks like he's on his bootstraps, if you ask me. Now, obviously, every year at the Chalk Valley History Festival, we have hundreds of different talks. Sadly, for the Chalk Valley History Show, we can only have one per episode, but we have chosen seven who would have been speaking this year had the festival gone ahead. Now, first up is Sophie Roberts, a brilliant travel journalist, and she's talking about her absolutely wonderful and totally fascinating book, The Lost Pianos of Siberia. My name is Sophie Roberts and I'm the author of The Lost Pianos of Siberia, um, a book published in February, um, part travelogue, part history, part madness. I give it eight of the ten. Well, Siberia is as much an idea as it is a place, and that is confusing until you start to go by its old imperial boundaries. So the old Tsarist boundaries define Siberia essentially from the Ural Mountains all the way across to the Pacific. And I chose to go by that definition all the way up to the Russian Arctic in the north and down to the borders of Mongolia in the south. Asked where it ends, Anton Chekhov said in 1890, I think, um, Siberia begins in the Urals and ends goodness knows where. And I took the poetry of that as my limit. So 
Yeah, it's huge. Um, it's a, about an eleventh of the world's land surface, and it's obviously um, difficult and uh, remote terrain where the human population is small. It's largely concentrated upon the old um, railway towns of the Trans-Siberian Railroad. Best travelled in winter, Siberia, <laughs> and if you take that main line through the Trans-Siberian, the Trans-Siberian Railroad, you start to understand its size. It's a, it's a week's journey, and that's using the modern trains. Trans-Siberian Railroad, it was an idea that came out in the 1890s, but it wasn't really complete, completed until, um, until after the revolution. You know, there, was a, it was a, there were some difficult parts to it, not least the Lake Baikal. Huge cliffs and uh, a very, very rocky, difficult terrain. It's one of the most expensive pieces of railroad that was ever built, um, this loop that went south of the lake. Uh, prior to that bit of railroad, they had this amazing um, uh, icebreaker that they would use and they would shunt the um, train carriages onto the back of the icebreaker and then transport it across. Sometimes it took a week to cross. This is a, 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 a narrow part of the lake towards the south, which took me four or five hours to cross in a, in a hovercraft in winter. But back then, a week to cross. There were other times where they tried laying the rails upon the frozen ice and pushing the train across that way, hauling it with horses. So it's a, it's a, it's a huge, huge undertaking, that Trans-Siberian. It took many years, but it was the, essentially what bound Siberia to Moscow. <laughs> So I started looking for pianos in Siberia, in Mongolia, which is a curious place to begin. But I never intended to write a book. I'm not a pianist. I'm not a historian. I'm a journalist. I've been going to Mongolia for a number of years. Originally, it was for an assignment for the Financial Times about the Kashmir industry. And I fell in love with Mongolia. I fell in love with the fencelessness of it, I fell in love with the wildness of it, and also the untold stories. There was a lot of untold story. And I started to return also with my family. It was where my kids were happy, and it was where our mobile phones didn't work. And we made friends with a family, a really interesting family there, who he's a German gentleman and married a Mongolian woman and they were bringing up their children in Mongolia and Nepal and their summers were always in this extraordinary um, piece of ground up in the Orkhon Valley. The Orkhon Valley is, the first time I went took two days to travel with no road from the city of the capital of Ulaanbaatar. Now there's asphalt more, more or less the whole way there. But it's wildly beautiful. It's got deep history. It's where Genghis Khan's empire was essentially founded in the city of Karakoram, not so far, maybe 20 miles away from where the tents are, where we stay. And I was there in the summer of 2015, um, pure private um, holiday for two or three weeks. And there was this rather extraordinary young woman who was teaching the German's child how to play piano. And she had a history with the family, so much so that they identified this God-given talent and helped with others to educate her in a conservatory in Perugia, in Italy. Uh, an absolutely top-class pianist. And one evening we were sitting in one of the Mongolian tents, the gares, the felted gares, which have the most perfect acoustics. And she was playing Bach to an audience of 20, 30, as I believe a pure and beautiful recital should be. And the way the acoustics worked, the way the music travelled up through the middle of this tent, through the hole, into the starry sky, was really deeply affecting. And at the end of it all, the German leant over to me and said, oh, how I wish she had a better piano. 
because she was playing on a Yamaha, a modern Yamaha, great kind of piano, but it had been heavily damaged by being in the strong um, climate of the steppe. And he leaned over and whispered in my ear, we must find her one of the lost pianos of Siberia. And the phrase stuck. He knew who, who, who he was saying it to. I started to look and I found that there was a logic to that phrase, which was just across the border to where we were in Russia, in Siberia, where in fact this Mongolian pianist's family had originally come in the 1930s, um, repressed Buryat people. Um, there was this extraordinary relationship with the piano. Russia had this sensational moment when the piano entered their culture and it spread. It spread as quickly as they were colonizing Siberia. So the European traditions, the European habits and the European governance, if you like, was spreading across those Ural Mountains with governors, governors' wives, explorers, renegades, misfits, all the fabulous people that ended up on the wrong side of the mountains. And with them, some of them brought pianos way before the train, way before it was even sensible to lug this instrument, this heavy, crazy instrument on the back of a sledge in the freezing temperatures for the comfort that music might give. So I then spent the best part of two, three years looking for a great piano that carried history, that carried story, that carried some sound. Most of pianos are of course broken. Um, pianos only have a certain amount of life. But I wanted to find something that maybe sat at the nexus of all those things that carried, to me, the. there was a brilliant quote I, that Edmund Duval wrote in um, The Hair with the Amber Eyes. And that, this was almost my sort of driving thought through the whole thing, which is objects have always been lost, retrieved, stolen. It's how you tell their stories that matters. And that was, to me, um, the founding principle of the whole mad escapade. So crazy in one way, but there was definitely a historic backbone that could justify it. So um, piano mania is a really interesting idea, partly because we confuse the word piano with lots of other keyboard instruments. Um, I take it, because I gave myself lots of latitude in this book, <laughs> I took it from the moment, 1774, Catherine the Great, who we know was an extraordinary um, advocate of European culture, uh, latched on to this very fashionable thing called the piano. And she commissioned one out of London um, as by, made by a maker called Zumpe. And that piano still exists rather wonderfully. It was one of the, my sort of coups, actually, my, my, my sort of archive coups is that in, um, we found this piano survives, but not only does it survive in Pavlos pa Palace outside of St. Petersburg, but it also had a period of time in Siberia. It was evacuated during the Second World War to an uh, unfinished opera house, the Novosibirsk Opera House, the largest opera house in Russia in the middle of Siberia. And it was kept there for safekeeping rather wonderfully. So it also had this, this um, extraordinary kind of Siberian history. But Catherine the Great started this fashion for pianos. She then sent her son and daughter-in-law packing off on a great European tour to educate them in all the wonderful things that were coming out of um, France and Vienna and the rest of it, where the daughter-in-law, Maria Fridovna, met Mozart and Clementi, where they played this magnificent duel. And uh, I was fascinated by this, one, because I'm in Dorset and Clementi has this extraordinary Dorset story and two, because that single moment in time, when you start looking into the letters, um, became this opportunity for Clementi, who wasn't just a great composer and a great pianist, but an opportunity for him to start selling like hotcakes into Russia. So he 
took along with him John Field, the Irish pianist, as his sort of performing monkey, and they went off to St. Petersburg and Moscow and they sold pianos like you wouldn't believe. And there's wonderful letters that exist about how, you know, make hay while the sun shines. And he, he worked um, John Field to the bone. And there was a moment in Petersburg where they called it Pianoopolis. There was more pianos than you could believe. And then that, that picks up pace. Franz Liszt comes in 1842, and there's this magnificent um, moment where people are clamoring for tickets. And, um, you know, Franz Liszt was the rolling stone of his time. People were grabbing at his hair to put into their lockets. They were picking up the cherry pips that he spat onto the ground. It was a phenomenon and Russia couldn't believe it. And they were excited by it. And that spawned an industry. So instead of importing Clementi's rather expensive overpriced pianos from England, um, they started to build their own. And Russia had an extraordinary piano industry. Uh, working with German artisans, tax breaks, everything they could do to make this thing fly. There's a very important moment in 1825 when the Decembrist um, revolt, um, what often is called the First Russian Revolution, um, a, a, a whole bunch of, of nobles and their wives end up in, in Siberia and the wives, in, namely, and in particular, Maria Volkonsky brings a piano with her. And when you have one great patron setting off an idea, when you have a teacher teaching more, something happens and that's what happened. And we also have other examples in other parts of the country where uh, similar things ha occurred. Siberia's story is completely wrapped up with the labour camps, the Gulag. It is completely wrapped up with the penal colonies that existed under the time of the Tsars. It is also wrapped up with music. And I was interested in trying to navigate a way through that while never forgetting the horror and the darkness and the millions and millions who died. But also trying to find some counterbalance to that among creative people who found in music enormous solace. So an example is Kolimar. Kolimar is the darkest reaches of the Gulag Archipelago, as Solzhenitsyn described it. It is, again, one of these parts of northern Russia that is, you can't reach by road. You can just now in a certain month, but it is wildly remote, tough country. And it was where the worst offenders would be sent, whatever their offence or imagined offence might have been. And I encountered there some really extraordinary stories. I, there was, first of all, in Magadan, which is the convict town into which these, these convict ships arrived, there was a a theatre still in use today and that was built by the prisoners where troops of performers prisoners were forced to perform and the stories there of what is music a travesty or is music a comfort and that was a really nuanced difficult um, um, part of my journey I probably spent two or three weeks up there I went into other areas into Colimar where I encountered stories of a, of a, a, a brilliant singer called Kozen, who was, um, he was arrested for um, homosexuality. And the stories of him being forced to perform and the audience's response to it were pretty amazing. I, I, I met um, one woman who's at the end of my book who remembers him playing. It was very moving. And this is a time when in the Gulag, you would be executed if you were found with a pen and paper. But yet, the last Tsar's piano teacher, Lars Tsarevich's piano teacher, 
was wrote an entire uh, 24 page piece of music on tiny little scrap notes no larger than an inch square it's kind of amazing so I liked trying to find the counterbalance to the horror while never conceding that it wasn't some of the darkest examples of human cruelty of the century. And it's very important to understand that the Gulag is only the 20th century version of the labor camp that existed before, which was the, when Siberia was, one historian, brilliant historian called it, you know, the largest continental prison without a roof. Um, people were sent there for penal labor, for life, for exile. And Chekhov, Anton Chekhov, made an extraordinary journey there in the 1890s. Um, and he traveled before the railway existed, all the way from Moscow to Sakhalin Island. Sakhalin Island is an island off the, off, off, off the Pacific edge. And um, he ended up in a mining town called Douai. And this mining town called Douai, coal mining, is really the end of the world. And he describes some extraordinary encounters, a very candid piece of, of journalism, essentially. Um, uh, the, New York, the New Yorker has called it the most important piece of investigative journalism of all time. Um, and you go, this little horrid town called Douai at the end of the world, where we recidivist offenders would be tired tied to their wheelbarrows for life yet there was music there was an amazing story that i discovered about this young woman whose husband was a murderer and she was a good pianist she'd been educated at the conservatory in st petersburg and there is an amazing description of her playing and all of the bel monde of this government of this horrible horrible penal colony patronizing her being rude to her um, treating her like a prisoner's wife until there's a visit from somebody from uh, moscow i'm not sure who recognized her and he recognized her as the great piano player she was and also from concerts she'd previously done and from that moment on she became the great sort of course celebre of this horrible little miserable town. Um, so yeah, that was a moment where you find a little tiny bolt of joy in music in the last place on earth you'd expect to find it. When I arrived in Douai, I, it was Russia Day, so that was particularly curious because it's when the everyone's feeling very pro-Putin, super, we love our nation, flags are flying, and everyone's on holiday. And so nobody's really concentrating <laughs> in the museums or in the, the officials, all the rest of it. So... That was both good and bad. I went trooping off from the main town of Alexandrovsk to Douai, and I was knocking on doors. And as I knocked on doors, there was about 20 people left in this community. Um, you know, it's a cliche, but it's a, a cliche for a reason. I got a lot of kind of um, glazed vodka stairs back until I knocked on one and I encountered a completely remarkable woman who was her grandfather had thrown his wife from the top of a bell tower. And so he was exiled to Siberia. And her father had, was the head of the House of Culture. So he was a free man and apparently a brilliant man who used to, with nothing, these people have nothing, would make music out of horse hair. He'd steal out of the tails of the animals at night. And he was a brilliant natural musician. And while they had no piano, 
he had the entire community of Douay um, in the palm of his hand with the performances he used to put on at this House of Culture. And as she spoke, she was not a, she was living in a, a, a pretty squalid environment. And as she was talking, I noticed this narcissus in a perfect, beautiful, fresh narcissus in a, a vase on her windowsill. And she took me to her father's grave, which was just about a four, three or four mile walk from where her apartment was, this run down place. And the only other place I saw the Narcissus was on her father's grave. And it was that care and humanity in a single flower that, if you like, was the essence of the whole story and why a single object, a search for a piano, can, yes, it can meander, it can go off on complete wild goose chases, but to go back to that Edmund de Waal comment at the beginning, it's the story that it releases. It's the story and how you tell it that really began to matter to me. And if I could humanize Siberia a tiny bit, while not forgetting what has happened, then I'd done my job as a journalist. I never approached this as a historian. I approached this as a journalist trying to find the stories in people's heads and the people, the stories in people's diaries and the stories that, that sat inside a piano. Um, but there were moments where I just felt it was all so real and present and like I was touching history. So a good example was when I was in the city of Tobolsk, which was where the last Tsar's family were incarcerated prior to their execution in Ekaterinburg. And they were doing up this governor's house where they were held under house arrest. And the um, builders, we walked in and the builders were pulling out of the floorboard scraps of paper. Uh, which were 19th century. They were, I was like, oh, what else is in the bones of this building that speaks to a history that hasn't been told? So I found it electrifying that over, um, you know, however many years and centuries have elapsed that you can touch history. And especially in a place as, I, Siberia excited me because it was ungoogleable. You know, it was so much of the story that I learned and was told was something that hadn't been recorded before. Whether it, whether it mattered is for you to decide as a reader, but it mattered to me as a touching history or every single corner. I loved it. It was, um, I found it electrifying. <laughs> So what I have here is a hand axe, what's termed by archaeologists as a hand axe. Um, and these tools 
begin to take shape in Africa uh, at about a million and a half years ago, so 1.5 million years BC, BP. Um, and it's made from quartzite, and it's been shaped using a stone to rough out the sort of rough shape from the original cobble that it was made from, and then something like a hard piece of wood or even bone to flake the stone to make effectively a cutting edge around its perimeter. You can see on this one that, that the cutting edge is quite sinuous. It goes backwards and forwards in a zigzag. And so this is a, a sort of early human. This is probably a human like Homo um, ergaster or Homo um, habilis even possibly. Um, and what we're looking at is a tool that's made predominantly for butchering meat or animals. And for years, archaeologists looked at these tools and they differ in shapes across the world and in material. So this one is flint and that one is quartzite. And they differ over the course of a million and a half years. And really, experimental archaeology, what we can do is we can make these, we can replicate them using the right materials, and we can understand what the brain is doing, what, what the brain has to, to achieve to make a three-dimensional shape out of stone. This one is flint, and it's a far more refined shape. This is one I've made, to be fair, but there are many real ones very similar to this. Um, and it's symmetrical in three planes, and it has a continuous cutting edge around its periphery. This one has very sharp flakes on the tip to make it razor sharp, in fact, sharper than razor sharp. Uh, but they're both classed as hand axes, although they're very different tools in the way you use them and the way they perform. Well, we're drawing near the end of this first Chalk Valley History Show, but we've got plenty more wonderful people on coming on this week. We've got Karen Manderback, the producer of Peaky Blinders. We've got my big bro, Tom Holland. We've got Adam Rutherford. We've got Andrew Zeminski, the stonemason, Saul David. The list goes on and on. But we're going to leave you with a film that was made at the festival back in 2017 by Joe Simpson and Henry Lynch with music by Martin Mazurek called Feel History.